Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Laura Stewart. I'm head of the Department of History, and I extend to you the very warmest welcome to what I think is going to be a really wonderful, really stimulating event. It's such a great pleasure as the head of a department to be able to talk so warmly about one of your own colleagues. Um, Jim Walden, I believe, has been at the University of York since, am I correct, Jim, 1966? 1965. <laughs> An historian who just got her dates wrong. Um, so it, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here to celebrate the work of someone who is not only a great scholar, but very much loved by our department. Jim remains in contact with people as young as me. Um, he's very much an active presence here. I think someone just laughed when I said that. <laughs> I'm not sure how to interpret that. But it's also a great pleasure to be able to um, be here with all of you at an event like this. Um, and I particularly want to say welcome to Jim's family and to his wife, Jenny. So thank you very much for coming this evening. I'm not going to say any more um, this evening, um, except to invite you to participate um, in this event and to look forward to the wine and canopies um, at the end. So I hope you'll stay um, and have a chat with us and with Jim uh, after this event. But without Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Professor Simon Ditchfield, um, who is going to chair the events. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, I should start with a confession that although I was an undergraduate here uh, in the 70s, I never actually took any course, went after 1700, so I never uh, got to meet Jim. And my first encounter with Jim actually was uh, via one of his books, appropriate enough, as he's written 42 of them. Um, and it was actually a book which I think really deserves um, to be reread today or read for the first time. It's a book he wrote to accompany a Channel 4 program, Victorian Values. And it was the decade when I had, I had uh, no television. It was a blissful decade in many ways. But it was, it was the late 80s. Uh, um, uh, Thatcher's uh, England was, was uh, at its worst. And so to read a book that dissected so absolutely brilliantly the misuses of history by a certain prime minister uh, was really refreshing. So I uh, looked Jim out as soon as I came back here as a postdoc um, in the 90s, and we've remained friends ever since. OK, well, straight on to today's events. Basically, it's, it's, we've used an excuse uh, to, uh, a genuine excuse, is to celebrate uh, Jim's career from looking at uh, his latest book. Uh, which uh, in many ways is a sort of capstone of all the, so many of the other books he's written uh, on slavery um, themes. And uh, as um, Jim says in the last sentence of the book, uh, who can now deny that slavery matters? And it's really, it's must be one of these people who, uh, for whom, uh, unfortunately, you know, his sort of research gets ever more relevant uh, as uh, his career, writing career has progressed. And... Um, to discuss this, we're very uh, pleased that both uh, Henrika uh, Alting, Professor of uh, Modern History. Henrika, technically, did you replace Jim? I can't remember. We, did. we don't have that these days. We didn't replace people, but irreplaceable Jim. But, uh, when Jim finally decided to retire, uh, Henrika, who had started her uh, a career in the Netherlands, went on to do a master's in Lancaster, and then went across and did uh, a PhD in, in the slavery subject at Hull and then came to us uh, via um, South Wales, isn't it, Glamorgan? Yeah. Uh, and so uh, um, Henrika is uh, co-director of, of the Interdisciplinary uh, Global Development Centre uh, and uh, is author, among other works, the um, recent article Tackling Child Malnutrition in Jamaica, 1962 to 2020, uh, and then in 2019, the monograph Public Secrets, Race, and colour in colonial and independent Jamaica. Henrika, please. Right, so I want to, I think, first of all, thank Simon for organising this and giving me the opportunity to read Jim's latest book. Um, what this book does, for those of you who haven't yet read it, and I really recommend that you purchase one outside, it really brings together aspects of the slave trade and slavery that Jim has explored in numerous books, and Simon mentioned the number, not all on slavery, but many are. And he combines that with new research to demonstrate that Atlantic slavery changed the world. Various academic books have been published in recent years that build on an argument that was made in 1944 by the Trinidadian historian Eric Williams in his seminal book, Capitalism and Slavery, 
that Atlantic slavery arose out of and underpinned capitalist development. And, and some of these books, for example, include Edward Baptiste, Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. These so-called new histories of capitalism make the case that the rise of the West was intricately linked to Atlantic slavery. Now, Jim Slater's book goes beyond that, and it makes the case that it also changed the world. And also, contrary to these new histories of capitalism, it doesn't just concentrate on the US, but it invokes examples from slave societies across the Americas, ranging from Barbados and Cuba to Brazil and Mexico. Also, the new histories of capitalism focus very much on production, but Jim's book is concerned with both production and consumption. Now, many of you will be familiar with the history of the triangular trade, the trade whereby European slave ships sailed to Africa with goods uh, on board that they exchanged for slaves, and then they took the slaves to the Americas, and then finally sailed back to Europe with slave-grown produce like sugar and tobacco. What Jim's book emphasizes is that this trade, this triangular trade, was a global trade. Uh, and then it relied very much on the empire. For example, slave ships that were departing from Liverpool, Bristol, and other British ports, they often carried Indian textiles that were not only used to purchase slaves in Africa, but also to close slaves on the plantations in the Caribbean. But Jim also highlights how slave-grown produce changed consumption patterns in the West. He refers to the fact that it made, made us addicted to tobacco, coffee, and sugar. And he also pays attention to the consumption patterns of the slaveholders. Many were keen to indicate their social sophistication by following the latest European fashion in interior design. They had their portraits painted by well-known painters. They purchased expensive mahogany furniture. Some of them, like Thomas Thistlewood in Jamaica or Landon Carter in Virginia, they also tried to demonstrate their social sophistication through purpose-built and well-stocked libraries. And the mahogany furniture um, that Jim refers to in his book, I think, is a really good example to show the global history of Atlantic slavery. The trend for mahogany furniture started in Britain, and it then moved to North America. But timber is alien to both. It is sourced, or it was sourced, from rainforest in Cuba, Jamaica, and the Mosquito Coast. It was logged by slaves, was then transported to North America, where it was unloaded from ships by slaves. And of course, it was domestic slaves that had to polish the mahogany furniture in the plantation houses. This is not an academic book. It's a book intended to convey to a wide audience that the history of Atlantic slavery is a truly global history. And one of the main tools that Jim uses to enable readers to make sense of that global history is the use of first-hand accounts. The book not only uses such well-known accounts as the interesting narrative and the life of Olado Equiano, which many of you may know, but also lesser-known accounts, like letters relating to the Ellison family that owned Hope Plantation in Jamaica. By using those first-hand accounts of both slaves and slaveholders, Jim humanizes the history of slavery. As the book argues, Atlantic slavery has been extensively documented precisely because slaves were regarded as property, they were entered into shipping logs, ledgers, wills, etc. By using first-hand accounts, Jim book, Jim's book shows us that the history of Atlantic slavery isn't just the history of capitalism, it's also a history of people. And the book covers a range of topics, from the Middle Passage to the domestic slave trade, which was especially prevalent in the US and Brazil, to the work regime on the plantations. But one aspect that hasn't received as much as attention, perhaps, as I would have liked, but really exemplifies the history of Atlantic slavery, is slave culture. Since the 1990s, that has become a key theme in slave studies. And whenever I've taught slavery, it's also been the topic that my students have always been most interested in. On plantations, different cultures came together. First of all, different African cultures, because large plantations received slaves from different parts of Africa that spoke different languages, had different religions, had different family systems, etc. And then secondly, European cultures. And the meeting of these cultures set in motion a process that's called creolization. 
it gave rise to new cultural forms, including dance, music, and food. So slaves, for example, had to cook for their owners using local ingredients while relying on their traditional knowledge of food preparation and appealing to the taste of their owners, and that gave rise then to Creole cuisine. As Jim mentions, even though Atlantic slavery was well documented, it wasn't really until the 1960s before the topic moved from the margin to the mainstream in academia. And Jim really demonstrates that shift in the book by drawing upon his own experiences of studying slavery for more than five decades. When he worked on a book called A Jamaican Plantation that he co-authored with Michael Creighton, slavery was only of limited interest to British historians. But today, we have a journal that is dedicated to slavery and abolition. Each year, historians at British University publish many books and articles on the topic, and some of you are here in the audience who do so. And it's also taught in core university history modules and options. Various factors explain that shift, um, including the rise of social history from the late 1960s, and increasingly also the rise of digital humanities. When I did my PhD in the late 1990s on discourses of slavery and abolition, my supervisor, David Richardson, at the University of Hull, was working on a project that became Slave Voyages. It is an online database that uses data from numerous archives and libraries in Europe, Africa, and the Americas that trace the voyages of slave ships. And if you go online to that free online database, you can explore where slaves were taken from, where they were sent to, where the rebellions occurred on slave ships, how many slaves died on the Middle Passage, and much more. Now, considering how much work has been done on the Atlantic slavery, I very much like to hear from Jim whether he thinks there are any remaining gaps in the history of Atlantic slavery. Are there perhaps themes or maybe even certain regions that have not been extensively covered? And also, are there still more sources that historians can discover? And if so, will that change the narrative that we have about Atlantic slavery? As mentioned, I did my PhD on discourses of slavery and abolition, more specifically about the role of Jamaican slave women in those discourses. But I've moved away from slavery studies. I first focused on the post-emancipation period, and more recently on the post-independence period in the Caribbean, and I focus mostly on Jamaica. But all of my post-PhD work deals with the longer legacy of plantation slavery in the Caribbean. In the late 1960s, various Caribbean academics formed what is known as the Plantation School. They argued that politics, society, culture, and economy in the independent Caribbean were a direct legacy of the slave plantation system. And with regards to society, they referred to a social stratification by class and color that I've examined in my latest book that Simon mentioned earlier. More specifically, that book focuses on colorism in Jamaica from 1918 till 1980. Colorism is a practice of allocating privilege or disadvantage based on the lightness and darkness of someone's skin color. And that process can be found across the Americas, and its origins lie in Atlantic slavery. Many slave children were fathered by white planters, and as Jim mentions in his book, often as a result of sexual violence. These children were given special privileges, such as exemption from field work, greater opportunities of manumission, all, account, all on account of their closeness to the white slave owner and whiteness. And this set in motion a skin color, color stratification process, whereby a higher value was placed on people with light skin, and where light-skinned people of African descent enjoyed greater privileges than their darker-skinned peers. It was already on my first visit to Jamaica for my PhD research that I noticed that process. I vividly remember going into a bank to cash my traveler checks, and I noticed that the doorman was very dark-skinned, the woman who helped me at the counter was lighter, and when she called the manager to deal with the problem I had cashing these checks, that woman was lighter still. My most recent work is on environmental vulnerability in the post-war Caribbean, and again, it's an issue that is linked to Atlantic slavery. As Jim shows in the book, the setting up of plantations and the logging of mahogany gave rise to deforestation. And that, along with various factors, other factors have made the Caribbean islands extremely vulnerable to hurricanes and floods. And it has also affected the quality of the soil, and that, in turn, has impacted on food security. 
Jim specifically mentions the case of Barbados. When the first Europeans visited the island, it was a wild forested island. But within a generation, to make way for cotton, tobacco, and increasingly sugar, deforestation had already been complete. And if any one of you has ever been to Barbados, you will know that it's not an, a full tropical, an island of full tropical forest, but it's really quite bare. And that is all the result of sugar and slavery. So Atlantic slavery had not just social, economic, political, and cultural impacts, but also ecological. And I want to finish with another long-lasting impact of Atlantic slavery. In the last part of the book, um, Slavery Matters, Jim mentions, and I quote, the rise of anti-slavery as a general principle of international diplomacy, especially post-Second World War through the United Nations, has seen slavery cast into outer darkness. Slavery has been cast in outer darkness, but it hasn't ceased to exist. In 2015, the UK passed the Modern Slavery Act. Between September 2020 and September 2021, under this act, 10,613 potential victims of slavery were referred. 48% of those were adults and 47% were children. The common nationality of potential victims was British accounting for 34% of all referrals. And the most common form of exploitation reported were labor exploitation for adults and criminal exploitation for children. Slavery then is on our doorstep. It's not something that takes place in the global south. And part of the reason why we do not often think of certain forms of labor exploitation as slavery is because it is so unlike Atlantic slavery. Atlantic slavery has become a model for slavery. I recently submitted a volume for the Bloomsbury's Cultural History of Slavery and Human Trafficking. It's a series of six books that starts with ancient slavery and it ends with modern day slavery. And the book I edited covers the period 1900 to 1945. As Jim mentions, Atlantic slavery was cringingly abolished in the 19th century, with Brazil the last country in the Americas to do so in 1888. It's often assumed that the first half of the 20th century witnessed the decline in slavery because plantation slavery in Americas had been abolished and also because international treaties were adopted to combat unfree labor, including the 1926 League of Nations um, Convention to suppress the slave trade and slavery. But my book shows that during the first half of the 20th century, the number of unslaved people globally increased dramatically as colonialism matured industrializing nations like Japan look further afield for raw products and cheaper labor, and global wars led to new demands for forced labor. But what my book also highlights is that the implementation of the League of Nations Slavery Convention was hindered by the fact that contemporary struggle to assess slavery on its own terms, resorting instead to the Atlantic slavery model. That is a system whereby slaves are property, to be sold or transferred at the will of the owner, are coerced into labor for which they receive no payment, pass on their status to offspring, and are markedly different from their owners. Colonial officials in Africa, for instance, turned a blind eye to forms of slavery that didn't quite match that model. But anti-slavery activists at the time also embraced that model because it was a powerful rhetorical tool. They referred to many unfree labor practices as slavery, even though they fell short of the 1926 slavery convention, like Indian indentured labor in the Caribbean. But historians, too, have found it hard not to use Atlantic slavery model for the 20th century, as illustrated by titles of such books as Slavery by Another Name, The Re-Enslavement of Black People from the Civil War to the Second World War. Some scholars merely invoke the trope of Atlantic slavery to convey an extreme degree of labor exploitation, but others actively search for elements that defined Atlantic slavery at the risk of ignoring or underplaying features that were unique to slavery in the first half of the 20th century. For example, many scholars have focused on overt resistance. Revolts and rebellions and other forms of overt resistance have been a common theme in Atlantic slavery studies, and Jim has written extensively about that in his, in his genre, in his oeuvre. But in many parts of the world, during the first half of the 20th century, slaves used more subtle means to resist, or they accommodated rather than resistant. 
Thus, the Atlantic slavery system that Jim so clearly and comprehensively lays out in this book has had varied and long-lasting impacts across the world, even affecting attempts to eradicate modern forms of slavery. Thank you very much indeed, Henrika, for such a, a wonderful uh, sort of contextualization uh, of uh, Jim's uh, field uh, and with lots of um, thoughtful um, issues, which I'm, in, I'm sure we'll enjoy. Uh, and I'll have the opportunity of having a, a discussion about this in the Q&A um, after uh, first David and then uh, Jim have spoken. Um, our next speaker, uh, David Osuga, requires very a uh, few introductions to uh, anyone here, I imagine. Uh, historian, writer, broadcaster, presenter, and filmmaker, uh, and of course, not forgetting, professor of public history at the University of Manchester. Uh, he began his academic career with a BA in history at the University of Liverpool before moving across and qualifying in uh, broadcast journalism at Leeds Trinity, uh, and then uh, he started a career as a researcher and a filmmaker and indeed, Jim always says that his first encounter with David was, I think it was at the BBC, um, where, um, and Jim said, you're on the wrong side of the camera, you should be in front of it. Um, and in fact, I, I totally agree, I mean, there's some wonderful, thinking particularly of the Forgotten Soldiers of, of Empire, uh, and um, which began his TV career, really, looking at um, the uh, service of, um, of soldiers of uh, soldiers of of, of, uh, of empire in the First World War to most recently, of course, um, a house through time. Um, David also co-presented Civilizations, which is a radical global remake, <coughs> excuse me, of the original uh, version of Civilization uh, by Kenneth Clark, and he was presenting this alongside uh, Mary Beard uh, and Simon Sharma. Uh, but perhaps he's most uh, well known for. Uh, his wonderful book, uh, Black and British, A Forgotten History, uh, which was awarded uh, both the Longman History Today Prize 2017 uh, and the Penn Hessel Tiltman Prize of the same year. And then uh, his most recent honour, aside from OBE, which I forgot to mention, uh, is in December uh, 2021 uh, when uh, David was awarded uh, the British Academy's President's Medal, which has only been awarded about 18 times in the last century for his, his contribution to... to uh, public life. So, David, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Henrika. I'm, I'm not going to speak for very long, but I, I, I want to speak uh, from the heart um, about what a privilege and a pleasure it is to be here tonight with Professor Wolven. Um, it's wonderful to read an, another book, yet another book, from Professor Wolven, A World Transformed Slavery in Americas and the Origins of Global is everything that you expect from a book with the words Jim Wolven on the cover. It's my pleasure to be here because this is a formidable book by an author of, as we heard, 42 books to his name. But it's also important because Professor Wolven has been an enormous influence on my work and on my life. And he's someone who I'm very honored to call a friend. Like anyone who has ever studied slavery, as an undergraduate or as a postgraduate. Jim Wolven's work has been a touchstone. It's been a reference point. It's been a place to go to find clarity and enriching details on that epic, terrible, astonishing story of slavery in the New World and slavery in all its many forms. Professor Wolven writes in this book, as in all his books, with a voice that draws out significances and connections and moments of irony, sometimes bitter irony, that otherwise might remain just below the surface, just out of reach. His prose is full of open questions and moments of clear-eyed analysis. When I read one of Jim's books, I can hear his, his voice. He speaks as he writes. It is one of those rare forms of writing that is, as editors often appeal to writers to have, to have a voice. There is always a clarity of voice in Professor Wolven's, uh, Wolven's work. And more than any other scholar, British scholar, Jim Wolven has educated our nation about the slave trade and new world slavery, not just Britain's role in that phenomenon, but slavery and the slave trade as vast geographic and chronological 
phenomenon. That canvas has never been broader than it is in a world transformed. But there's another arena of my life and my experience and my work that's been enriched and expanded by Professor Walvin, um, because that is the understanding of who I am. I was brought up in the 1970s and the 1980s, about 70 miles north of, of where we are today. I was brought up on Tyneside. My father is Nigerian from uh, Lagos, from a town called Ijebudet in, in to the north of Lagos. My mother was British, of uh, English, of um, Scottish derivation. I'm a Nigerian Geordie, which takes some explanation. <laughs> but when I was growing up, there was no explanation. There was absolute clarity in my family about my background. I knew and know my father's background. My father came to visit. We were imbued in our Yoruba Nigerian culture. My father, every time he was with us, would try to force us to try to remember the Yoruba words he'd try to impose upon us in his last visit. And my mother's family, proud working class, were deeply, deeply um, committed to teaching their new mixed race members of the long history that they were part of, having less left the soil, the soil of East Lothian in the 19th century, come to the, to the Northeast to become industrial workers, to become part of a union movement and a labor movement. All of that was clear to me. But I'm a, I'm a third thing. And like two million people, in this country, I'm a third thing. I'm black and British. And growing up, that had absolutely no meaning. It had no history, and it had no legitimacy. There were two authors in my life, in my youth, whose books provided answers to those critical questions of identity. The first was Peter Fryer, whose book Staying Power was a, a pivotal book in the purchase that I purchased when I was four, when I was 16. And the other was the work of Jim Walvin. When I was a teenager, I read Black and White, The Negro and English Society. I read it at Newcastle University. I wasn't a student at Newcastle University, but I managed to literally flirt my way through into the university <laughs> and be able to, put, re, re, uh, to work on my A-levels there. I didn't have a right to take any books out, so I had to sit there and read books that I came across. And I read every word of Black and White sitting at Newcastle University. And it was an astonishing revelation. It opened up a pantheon of, of black Britons, and it made sense to that identity that had no legitimacy when I was growing up. It was one of the two books that gave me a warrant to be who I am, that gave my identity some meaning. Now, the lives of many of those black people who were present in Britain, that Professor Walvin revealed to me, were connected to slavery. Some of them were not. It expanded a sense of what it was to be British and to be black. When I was at university a couple of years later, I read some of Professor Walvin's other books. When I was studying, Professor Walvin uh, published Black Ivory, uh, Slavery and the British Empire. I remember buying my copy back when buying a book was a major expense and it had to survive a cost-benefit analysis of student finances. And it was a key text that was part of the little library of books that I carried from shared flat to shared flat while I was studying. In 1998, I became a radio documentary producer for Radio 4 and the World Service. And I had one big ambition. I wanted to make programs about the histories that I'd read in Professor Walvin's books and elsewhere. And inevitably, I turned to Professor Walvin himself. I've been to this campus twice. One was tonight, and one was in 1998, when I first met Professor, Professor Walvin. We made programs together, and I still turn to Professor Walvin 24 years later, uh, now as a TV producer and a presenter, whenever I'm entering into a project that is connected to the stories of slavery and empire. Just last year, Professor Walvin was the critical consultant in a landmark series we made for the Smithsonian Channel that was broadcast in the UK by... Channel 5, and he is currently consulting on a series of short films that we're currently making. And I think most importantly to me, my, my book, Black and British, that Simon mentioned earlier, it is a homage to the work of Professor Walvin and his generation of pioneering historians, both inside and outside the academy, who offered me answers to my questions about identity, 
but who also, when I was a teenager, shone a light onto other hidden histories that were then not just invisible, they felt out of bounds, they felt illegitimate. To read Professor Waldron's book was to, was to be confirmed in the idea that this is legitimate history, this is important history, and its significance had been minimized in a way that I think is now breaking down. In recent years, Professor Wolvin's work has taken history into the present, a world transformed as, as perhaps the apotheosis of that process. His history of sugar is a catalog of the history of that toxic, addictive crop. Uh, Enrica mentioned the, the three crops at the center of the story of slavery, coffee, sugar, and tobacco. Well, my 30s were dominated by the struggle to give up smoking, and my 40s were dominated by the far, far more difficult struggle to give up sugar as I have a family with a history of diabetes, I can attest to their addictive nature. Thank God I've still got coffee. <laughs> as someone who believes, as James Wolven once wrote, that people are trapped in history and that history is trapped in them, Professor Wolven's work does what history does at its best. It is as much about the present as it is about the past. It shows that we are stumbling around in the ruins of the empire of slavery and yet for decades have refused to recognize that history, despite, as Jim writes in this book, the overwhelming scale of the historical archival evidence. At this moment, when the centrality of these histories of slavery, empire, race, conquest, on our culture, our language, our ideas, our cuisine, our wealth, is finally being discussed and debated, with greater energy and openness and urgency than ever before. The work of Professor Wolven seems like it is just of this moment, in keeping with current trends. But that is a profound misreading of Professor Wolven's work and its significance. Jim's been exploring these histories since the late 1960s. This book and his work, it is not of this moment. It is central to creating this moment and these debates that we are now able to have. Conversations, the research, the acceptance, the reading that has happened, particularly since 2020 and the merger of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter, that very quickly in this country became a question about history. And the histories that we've turned to were built on the foundations that Professor Wolverine and his generation created. I'd like to end by simply saying thank you. Thank you for your work and thank you for your friendship. Thanks very much indeed, David, for that very moving testimony to the significance of uh, Jim's work. Um, I want to begin, actually, with the fact that um, rather, rather different emotion that uh, uh, Jim has evoked in me, which is guilt. And that is because quite often, one of the first emails I get of the day is from Jim, and he's already written 3,000 words. <laughs> um, but uh, he's been really a terrific uh, friend uh, to the field and to the people that makes it. I mean, one thing that Jim has never forgotten, uh, and I'm going to just do a very brief, read a very brief uh, uh, extract in a moment, is that the, really history is about people. Uh, and uh, it's also the writing of history is about friendships with people. And I know nobody uh, who's got a, a wider circle of friends uh, than, than Jim Walvin. Um, the book that, um, well, one of the books that David mentioned, the a uh, book from 1974, uh, Black and White, uh, was actually um, Jim's first sort of uh, significant published recognition. It, was, it won the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize in 1974. Uh, and he's gone on to win uh, quite a few other prizes and awards. Uh, uh, one of the more recent ones was when he was awarded an OBE. And I tried to congratulate him. So, of course, whenever you try to be nice to Jim, he always, he always sort of replies, sardonically or with some sort of uh, 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 witticism in this way, he said, oh yes, you mean my award for my medal for my services to philately. And what he meant was he'd helped, he said, oh, well, I just helped design the stamps to, to mark the 1807 uh, uh, commemoration of the abolition of the slave trade. But that's really uh, goes along with the fact that Jim is just so darn humble about what he does. Uh, and there's not a trace of self-importance, which is so rare uh, in our profession. 
Um, but sorry, that's come out all wrong. But, uh, you, you know what I mean. Acad academics can be very self-important, but that's not something that ever uh, has, has, troubled, has troubled Jim. Jim, of course, has been when the time much before, long before it was fashionable. He used to reach out and be basically be a public historian. Um, and indeed, he was curator and historical advisor for the Liverpool Maritime Museum, uh, for the British Parliament's exhibition, The Abolition of the Slave Trade in Westminster Hall in 2007, and for the British Government Committee on the Abolition of the Slave Trade, which is when he, he award, was awarded his gong. He's also been elected uh, um, to the Royal Society of Literature, uh, which also reflects the fact he, he writes down well. Um, also a member of the European Academy, as well as the um, Royal uh, Historical Society. Another thing he's done, which uh, is really a major achievement in its own right, uh, is that for 20 years he edited uh, the journal Slavery and Abolition. And as someone who just stood down from editing a journal, uh, not near a bit such a big journal, for merely 11 years, 20 years is quite a, a time to do that. I mentioned right at the beginning when, when this evening's event that one thing that uh, uh, made me aware again of Jim was his fantastic book, Victorian Values, and how it's, it's just really the tone uh, and his um, sensitivity to individual examples and case studies uh, is unrivaled. And so I want to just uh, read you an example here uh, of uh, a letter uh, from um, a, a, a slave, a former slave, who would be probably known to quite a few of you, Ignacio Sa uh, Sancho or Sanchez, um, who uh, enjoyed the patronage uh, of, the, um, of the great and the good in London. But he also, what I didn't realize, he once uh, wrote to uh, Lauren Stern, uh, the novelist, and um, read Up the Road in Coxworld, and he was the, he was the uh, parish priest there. Um, and I just think the extraordinary tone of this letter, I mean, I just want to read it to you. To Mr. Stern, July. 1776. Reverend Sir, it would be an insult on your humanity, or perhaps look like it, to apologize for the liberty I am taking. I am one of those people whom the vulgar and illiberal call niggers. A little reading and writing I got by unwearied application. The latter part of my life has been, through God's blessing, truly fortunate, having spent it in the service of one of the best families in the kingdom. My chief pleasure has been books. Consider slavery, what it is, how bitter a draught, how many millions are made to drink it. I'm sure you will applaud me for beseeching you to give one half hour's attention to slavery, as it is at this day practised in our West Indies. Dear sir, think in me you behold the uplifted hands of thousands of my brother Moors. Grief, you pathetically observe, is eloquent. Figure to yourself their attitudes. Hear their supplicating addresses. Thank you, Jim. My turn. My turn. I'm going to stand up and do it. I, I can't sit down and talk, I'm afraid. So I'll go over here um, to, to be more comfortable, if you don't mind. Um, well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you for the, to the Bond and colleagues for arranging the, the, the evening, really. Um, um, it, it's been rather like living through your own obituary. Um, <laughs> And if any of them can carve on the headstone, I'm happy to employ them as well. So thank you very much indeed. I was terribly flattered by what was said. Um, it's very touching and, um, well, thank you very much indeed. I arrived at this university in um, 1965 um, as um, a young graduate student uh, determined to become a kind of historian of working class England, fired by that extraordinary book of Edward Thompson's Making of the English Working Class a couple of years before. And um, I came with a message ringing in my ears from the professor who taught me the year before in Canada, said, you, you mustn't rush into print. 
And he certainly didn't. He certainly didn't. Um, but um, I came with that message ringing in my ears. And in fact, um, this book is a, a, an example to that, because I actually started it in 1967. Um, so that makes it, what, 50-odd years? Because in 1967, by a whole series of um, quirky circumstances, I ended up in Jamaica. And that summer, um, spent the best part of three months sitting in a very hot, steamy shed in the middle of rural Jamaica, working my way through plantation ledgers, um, some of them half the size of this, uh, this table. Enormous pieces of um, literature on which were written all the details of the property that I was staying on, Worthy Park Estate, founded in 1670, still going strong as a sugar plantation. And what was clear about uh, that, what I worked on then is that everything I read in the summer of 1967, everything I transcribed and worked out the data from, is, uh, led me to the kind of issues that I was talking about in this book. Um, the ledger itself. The ledger itself came from London, shipped 5,000 miles away. It was filled in by clerks, by bookkeepers, large numbers of them Scots. The Scots, you cannot understand the world of slavery in the Americas without the Scots. The literate, numerate Scots, highly educated, better educated than their English counterparts, uh, filled the plantations and filled the, the ledgers that I was looking at. Um, and the ledgers that um, I looked at um, listed other things, everything on the plantation. The Africans, first of all, the most striking thing is lists of Africans, their names, or the names that have been given to them. Many of them were given classical names, uh, Caesar, um, Pompey, Pluto, um, insulting names, Big Fat Nelly, some African names, not many, some African names. So you've got classical references, Africans, African names, um, the tribal backgrounds, uh, which weren't really tribal backgrounds the more we look at it. Um, and that led me ultimately, of course, to explore some of the places that those Africans have been shipped from, that is the great slave forts of West Africa, of uh, Cape Coast and um, uh, Gore, the French, French island. Um, and then the other lists on the opposite page to the Africans were the lists of the cattle. Now, that leaps off the page at you. Africans on one side, cattle on the other. Now, there's something very interesting there. Uh, about the mindset of people who draft a document with the people on one side and the beasts of the field on the other, or in fact both sides are beasts of the field as, as, as they were used. I'll turn the page over, there you find a string of imported goods, a record of what was imported, or the, the ledgers I'd mentioned. But every single item that people used and consumed and worked with on that plantation, uh, were, were, every single item was imported. Uh, we had um, butter imported from Ireland, uh, barrels of herrings, of fish from Newfoundland to feed the, the Africans, uh, clothing, clothing that was rough uh, Osnabergs from Germany, um, uh, cool fabrics that were imported from India. Think of this for a second. You're in the middle of Jamaica, you've got Africans being clothed in textiles from Germany, from India, being fed by, uh, with fish from the Newfoundland fishers, uh, and everything that they used, the axes, uh, the, equi the metal equipment they used in the factory, in the fields, the leather goods, which, which were used to whip the slaves as well as the horses, all of that was imported from the various industries of Britain itself. And those Africans on that estate, like so many others, produced sugar. Sugar comes to dominate. It's not the only uh, commodity, but it's the, it's the biggest, the dominant one. And the sugar is shipped back to this country to, to be refined and passed on. And the sugar is then done what? What do people do with the sugar? They put it in sugar bowls. And many of those sugar bowls in wealthier homes were produced in China, por Chinese porcelain. Think of it again. You've got Chinese porcelain being shipped to Europe. To, where, and it contains sugar grown by Africans in the Caribbean. And, what, and, and it is then mixed with what? With tea and with coffee. What could be more English? People complain, I say this all the time, but what could be more English than a sweet cup of tea? But think of it. Sugar from the Caribbean, tea from China, put into kind of um, commodities produced in China. You're looking at an extraordinary global phenomenon. And very often, the Africans themselves have been purchased substantially by textiles that have been shipped from India. We now, it's, it's pretty clear now that the, the volume of 
Indian textiles used in the exchange of Africans was really very considerable. This isn't a triangular trade, this is a global trade. The, the trade of the Indian Ocean and beyond is locked into the world of the Atlantic slave trade. So we've got to get away from the idea that this is a, a triangular trade. Um, the people who owned plantation were English, English settlers from 1670 onwards. Uh, and as soon as they could, of course, they got out, they went and then came back home. There were common pattern in the English Caribbean of um, uh, people not regarding the Caribbean as home. They'd come back and settle here, but still manage their properties um, from 5,000 miles away. An extraordinary phenomenon. All of the commodities that they produced on that estate were shipped out to the ships waiting for them to bring, ship them back to, to Britain. And they went over the mountains to a small port on the south coast of Jamaica called Port Henderson. Right across the bay from Port Henderson is a fort, Fort Henderson, still there. And if you travel the Caribbean, you cannot help but be struck by the military presence from the 16th, 17th, 18th century. If from Havana down to Barbados, the, the great port and the fort at Havana is a kind of classic example of it. All of the islands owned by different uh, European competitors have their military uh, facilities, mainly for naval uh, docking. And what it was a reminder of is that those uh, military facilities are vital, not merely in the kind of European game that is being played in keeping those islands and exploiting them, but more especially keeping the slaves in place. The Royal Navy writes its marching song um, in 1760, uh, come cheer up my lads, it's just a glory each year. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, we, uh, we call it to uh, uh, not treat you like slaves, is one line. Well, what an irony. The Royal Navy singing that from 1760, when at that very time, the Royal Navy is monitoring the slave ships and uh, keeping other people out, and also overawing the Africans on the islands. It's much easier and quicker to move troops around the island of Jamaica by ship than it is to walk them across the island when you have slave insurrection. The Royal Navy and military forces throughout the Caribbean, not just the English, throughout the Caribbean, Naval forces are absolutely vital to keeping the lid on this extraordinary phenomenon of slavery in the Americas. Now, all of this leaps out of the page of any one single ledger. And yet, it didn't strike me that way in um, 1967. I was, in, I was working on a single uh, study, a, a unique study of one plantation. And yet, thinking about that now, all of those leads take you to this wider story that culminated in this particular book. Um, but the other thing that um, occurred to me when I first worked on, in Jamaica is that just how, and it seems such an obvious, banal thing to say, but just how different Britain looked when you're looking at it from 5,000 miles away. British history seems very, very different when you're looking at it from Jamaica or from Bengal or from Cape Coast. You're looking at a, a history that is not the kind of history that we're familiar with within these islands. Um, Britain looked very different, physically from a distance, and historically it looked very different. And the curious thing about it when I came, I remember coming back that first time in September of 67, and then back again at Christmas 67, 68, thinking, I don't see much recognition of the relationship between what I've been poking around in Jamaica and the world that I grew up in and was trying to come to terms with, that is the history of, the, uh, of Britain itself, and partic particularly the, the history of the, of the north of England. And yet, I, you know, I grew up in North Manchester, Oldham, literally under the shadow of the cotton mill. And in 1860, up to, up to 1860, where did most of that cotton come from that made the Lancashire textiles mills? It came from the US South, and who cultivated it? The slaves of the Mississippi Delta. Um, and wherever you go, the road leads back to slavery. Um, and yet, at the time, the study of slavery was marginal, as a number of people have said already. It was marginal and ins insignificant. The curious thing about that was that the, the sheer volume of paper, the paper trail on slavery, is simply phenomenal. And I, I, in, this, in this particular book, I'm trying to make the point that because slaves are regarded as things and are, are documented as things from the moment they step onto a slave ship, from the moment the slave ships leave the European ports through to the point that their product is sold in Europe itself, because the slave is a thing, they are documented in a way that free working people are not documented. We actually know much, much more about slaves in, let's say, 
uh, the 18th, early 18th century, we do about contemporary English laboring people. It's a quite extraordinary phenomenon. And yet, despite that fact, and despite the fact that archives are, have shelves by the mile of documents dealing with slavery and the slave trade, that it was, there were noises off stage, except to a small group of um, academics and a small group of uh, scholars, particularly Caribbean scholars, um, especially from the 1930s onwards. And it was the, what has happened in the intervening years has been the kind of movement of that, that subject of slavery and its relationship to the Western world from a marginal position to a much more central one. Now, it's not just slavery. This, is a, this raises a much broader question of the relationship between the Western world and the wider world, and particularly, in our case, particularly uh, our relationship with India. You cannot exclude India from the story I'm talking about here. And the difficulty then, of course, is that no one historian can be the master of all this. You can't possibly be the, uh, the historian of, of, of India and the relationship with the, of, between Britain and India and the Caribbean and the great area that's wide open for exploitation. The question that uh, uh, Henrika raised is um, Africa. Um, the, the, there's some terrific books been recently uh, published recently about Africa. Um, Fistful of Shells. Uh, Toby Green's a kind of wonderful evocation of this, and ex exploring uh, not merely the internal history of Africa, but it's the extraordinary relationship between the Western world and Africa. What lies behind all this is um, a kind of re a revision, I suppose, of our history, the history of the British people. And it seems to me increasingly, as I stagger into my 80s, that um, uh, you can't really understand our, uh, our own history without understanding our involvement with the people of the wider world. It's not, uh, you can't really compartmentalize it. We, it. It's not possible to understand British history without understanding that we are intimately involved with those people, that many of them subject people uh, of the wider world, the Indian peoples of the Americas, Africans shipped into the Americas, people of India and China and our economic links with them. It's all interlinked. And the, the theme that emerges ultimately from all this, and I end with this, is that the British and other Europeans have traditionally been very generous with the lives of others, put it no more strongly than that. Um, that's the book that tries to spell that out in more detail than I can give today. Uh, let me end as I began, uh, thanking my obituarists <laughs> for their generous um, commentary on, on my work. Um, whether the book holds up is up to the readers to decide. Thank you very much.